you have an enemy whose sole purpose is to absolutely to destroy you. It's not a game. It's not something from the mythological world. It is true that all of us have an enemy and his aim is to totally destroy you. Now, how would he do that? How is it that Satan would uh, move into one's life and destroy us? We might think, well, Satan is going to use great, uh, gross, immoral sins. Well, that, that certainly could be. But you know what? Satan more often than not uses things like an unforgiving spirit, an unproven love, and a disobedient heart. Which means that Satan could move into a service like this. And he could work on someone's heart and say, you know what? They haven't really earned your love. And Satan says, uh-huh. I was waiting on that. Or you could say, you're crazy. I am not forgiving him. And Satan says, that's just what I need. An open door. And you say, oh, preacher, that, that's not really in the Bible. Well, let's take a look in the book of 2 Corinthians. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I want to speak to you today about the devices of Satan. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul warned the church at Corinth about the devices of Satan. It is always apropos that we be reminded of the schemes, the plots, the ploys of the devil. Would you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse number 5. But if any have caused grief, he has not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient is such a man is to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. So that contrarywise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Our Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. May we open now our hearts and our minds that we would receive with a spirit of meekness the engrafted of word into our hearts. Father, do in us according to your good pleasure and will mold and make us into what you want us to be. And Father, if there's one here today without Christ, they've never been saved. Lord, we know it's your will for them to be saved. We pray that as they hear your word, experience the conviction of your spirit, may they today repent and believe on the Lord Jesus. May you receive all of the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Satan uses um, things in our life to gain a foothold. And that area of our life that we allow Satan to come into becomes a beachhead. And he sets up shop in our heart. And from there, he, he lobbies his fiery darts into our life. What would it be that he would use? Well, in the Corinthian church, he used such things as, as a, an unforgiving spirit, as an unconfirmed love, and as an unproven uh, obedience to the Lord. You see, Satan doesn't have to take those big public things, that uh, sins that people sometimes commit. Satan works from the inside out to destroy our lives. In the church at Corinth, the unity of the body of Christ was being threatened. In the first uh, letter that he wrote to them, there was a man that was involved in, a, in an immoral relationship with his stepmother. And Paul said that they were to have no fellowship with him. Uh, that that he, was to, he was to be treated as an outsider because of the grossness of his sin. After the passing of time, apparently the man repented and Paul writes this letter to say, Now wait a minute. It's time... To receive him back. 
It's time to love him. It's time to forgive him. Let me say this to you. Discipline is necessary, but restoration is always the goal. Um, retribution is never an acceptable goal of discipline. It is always about restoring. And so Paul says, how are you going to view those who have been outside the will of God? How are you going to view those who have fallen? How are you going to treat those that that have uh, uh, committed sins that you haven't committed? And he says, if you don't handle it right, Satan will use your attitude. And he will use devices, schemes, ploys that will bring you down. I want to show you three devices of the devil from our text tonight. today. First of all, notice that there is an unforgiving spirit. You see what he says in verse number 7. He said, so contrary wise, you, rather, you ought rather to forgive him. It's interesting to me that Paul does not mention his name. Paul does not uh, make any reference to his sin. He just calls him him. And he says, contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him. How do we treat those who have fallen? I'll tell you how we treat them. With a spirit of forgiveness and comfort. I, you know, I, if, if there's one thing you take from the message today, I hope you take this one. We are all capable of anything. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. So here's this, here's this guy that has been involved in, in uh, uh, all kinds of immorality. And Paul says, now you ought to forgive him. You ought to forgive those who have fallen. And and the Word of God uh, urges us as Christians to practice forgiveness, and it does so on this basis. Why should I forgive others? Why should you forgive others? Why should you forgive those who have hurt you? Why should you forgive those who have hurt the cause of Christ? It is not for uh, any other reason than this. Forgive one another even as God for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. If God's holding a grudge against you, then you're free to hold a grudge against somebody you want to hold a grudge against. If God refuses to forgive you, then you're free to refuse to forgive somebody that's hurt you. If God is stingy with his forgiveness, then you have a right to be stingy with your forgiveness. So ah, you're being facetious. I know, and you are too when you refuse to forgive. That's the point. So this idea, but, but, but I, I've been hurt. Uh, this idea, I've been disappointed. The idea that, that, that it, is, uh, it is so egregious, I, I could never forgive somebody like that. It is not based on how you feel. It is not based on the, on the enormity of the offense that has occurred to you. It is based on the fact that God in His grace and God in His goodness has forgiven you. Let me assure you today that you have been forgiven by God a greater debt than anybody could ever incur against you. Ah, you remember what um, Jesus said? I love this this story and then the parable Jesus spoke to illustrate it. Peter and all of his self-righteousness and all of his um, supposed goodness says to the Lord, my brother offends me. It's always struck me ironic that Peter didn't assume he would be the one doing the offending. <laughs> Instead he said, if my bro- when my brother offends me. By the way, I might just stop right here and preach a little bit. <laughs> anybody, anybody here feel that way? Your first thought is you're going to be offended, not that you're going to be the offender. What's, what's wrong with that picture? Let me tell you what's wrong with that picture is that we are all broken and fallen and depraved and we are quite capable of offending other people. So, but I didn't mean to. It doesn't matter whether you meant to or not. An offense is an offense, right? It happens. 
Peter said, Lord, my brother offends me. How often should I forgive him? I'm going to be super spiritual. I'm going to be super pious. And and I'm going to go above and beyond the norm and the standard of the day. And Jesus said, you're to forgive in an unlimited way. As often as the offense comes, that is how many times you are to forgive those who have offended you. You can imagine how bug-eyed Peter must have been when he heard those words. Unlimited. And Jesus spoke a parable. There were two servants. One of the servants owed another servant. Owed the king, rather, a million dollars. And he goes to the king and he said, what I need here is time. If I have time, I can pay off my debt. Well, I'm going to tell you something. As a slave, a servant... He didn't need time. He needed a miracle from God. On what he made as a slave, he would never, ever in a million years, ever pay off his debt. It ain't happening, y'all. It's not, he's not going to do it. He owes a million dollars. He has nothing. He makes nothing. And he says the most audacious thing you can imagine, I need time. He doesn't need time. He needs an intervention of God. But wonderfully, gracefully, the king says, okay, I'll do one better. I'll forgive the debt. I'm sorry I didn't hear you. That was in my bad ear. What'd you say? I forgive you. You don't need, I don't need time. No, you don't need time. You don't need time. You don't need money. You don't need a miracle from God. You don't need an intervention from God. It is all Gone. You owe me nothing. See, here's the slate. It is clean. It is white clean. It is white cleaner than Hillary's server. It's clean. Uh, (laughs) There's nothing there. It is clean. And so he he says, you don't owe me anything. But the debt was a million dollars. But you don't owe me anything. But it was a massive, enormous debt. But it is forgiven. It's sent away. Here you are, here your sin is, I've divorced you from your sin, you will never see it again. You can imagine the joy, the exhilaration, the jubilation, the thankfulness that must have been in the heart of that servant as he leaves the presence of the king with the words, you are forgiven, ringing in his ears, you are forgiven. No. No, no, the words are not ringing in his ears. There's not joy, there's not jubilation, there's not excitement. Instead, this servant has one thing on his mind as he leaves the presence of the king. He's been uh, forgiven a million dollar debt and there's one thing on his mind and that is, where is that sorry fellow servant that owes me a dollar? I can't stand him. He angers me. He he, uh, makes my blood boil. He's been forgiven a billion dollar debt and he is upset over a dollar. Well, there's a little bit of all of us in that servant that's been forgiven a million dollar debt. Anytime you allow a barrier to come up and say, I won't forgive, I can't forgive, you are that servant that has left the presence of the king and you're saying, even though I've been forgiven a million dollar debt, I cannot forgive a dollar debt. I can't do it. By the way, that's a lie of the devil. That's one of the devices of Satan. The device of Satan is that he will lie to you and say, you can't. Why don't you be honest with yourself and honest with God and honest with the devil and say, what is the truth? I won't. The issue is not that you can't forgive. The issue is you refuse to forgive. So here is this king and he's, been, uh, he's forgiven this uh, uh, servant a million dollars. He will, not, he will not forgive a fellow servant of a dollar debt. The king finds out about it. As kings are wont to do. And he says find him. Find that fellow that's been forgiven that million dollar debt. Who will not forgive. I want to tell you there's a price to pay dear one. For this spirit of unforgiveness. Paul says forgive this one who has been guilty of this sin. And notice what he said and comfort him. I guarantee you. 
There's not a person here today who hasn't been hurt. Some way or the other. Parent, spouse, um, co-worker, church member, preacher. All of us have been hurt in one way or the other. And I'm telling you, God's message to us today is forgive. And here's what happens when you don't. You have fallen for the lie of the devil. You have fallen for the device of Satan. I'm going to hold and harbor and hang on to this unforgiving spirit. And Satan says, yep, and when you do, I'm going to use it against you. And eventually, I will choke the spiritual life out of you with that spirit of unforgiveness. Oh, let me tell you, don't let Satan, don't let, don't let Satan use this spirit of unforgiveness against you. And so he says, first of all, the device of Satan is number one, it is an unforgiving spirit. But notice number two, it is an unconfirmed love. Look what he says in verse 8, wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm, that you would reaffirm your love toward him. This uh, uh, love toward him, again, he refers to him as him. He doesn't give his name, he doesn't give any information about whoever this is. He is anonymous, him. And he says, reaffirm, confirm your love toward him. So we have on the one hand, forgiving. We also have loving. You know, some people are just easier to love than others. I, I, I don't know if you've made that uh, discovery in your journey of life or not, but I'm just telling you, uh, well, from my perspective, some folks are just easier to love than others. Some are hard to love. Some are just uh, difficult. You know, some people have a mind of their own and they don't see everything the way I do and that makes it hard to love them. <laughs> and and, 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 and there, there, there are some people that do stuff. I mean, they just do stupid stuff. And, and I think, what? And then I do stupid stuff and they say, what? <laughs> and I, you, know, you know what I'm saying? I want to tell you, as Christians... We, don't have, we should not view this as an option of whether we're going to forgive somebody or not. And as Christians, we should not view this as an option of whether we're going to love somebody or not. As Christians, we forgive. As Christians, we love. I'm going to tell you this matter of forgiveness and the matter of love is the same. We are to forgive as God has forgiven us and we are to love as God loves us. Amen. Let me ask you a question. How does God love you? By the way, for all the legalists here today, if there are any... If you're a legalist and you have the wild-eyed idea that God loves you because you're in Sunday school and church on Sunday morning, or you're a legalist and you think God loves you because you gave an offering, or God loves you because of this, that, or the other, let me tell you that God doesn't love you because of what you do. God loves you because God is God and God is love. You don't earn the love of God. Hey, you know what? Not only do you not, do you not earn, the love of, earn the love of God, you don't deserve the love of God. God's love for us comes out of His being, not out of our being. So there is God whose essence is love, whose nature is love, and He sees us as we are, dirty, filthy, depraved, estranged, outside the will of God. And yet God loves us because He's God. Now Paul says this way, I want you to love this guy. This guy that has been involved in sin. This guy that has brought embarrassment upon you, I want you to love him. I want you to love him not because he deserves it. I want you to love him because I told you to love him. I want the love to come out of you because you're a Christian. By the way, did you know the Bible says in Romans 5 that when we are saved, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts? Amen. That means I can't love is a lie. If God's love is already there, you can love. And God says, it's shed abroad in your hearts. We're to love that fallen Christian. We're to love everybody. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Not by how, how, how high you jump. Not by how, how spiritual you think you are. But all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Let me just say this to you, and I'm going to move on. Just because a 
fellow's wounded. That doesn't mean he's got to die. Christians have no business in shooting their wounded. Sure, they may be wounded. Let's get them to Jesus as quick as we can and see what he can do with them. Just because a man is down and bleeding and bruised, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean he's, he's dead. Doesn't mean he's going to die. Christians got no business killing their wounded. Let's bandage them up and get them to Jesus. Give them a chance. Love them. Don't write anybody off. You know what? Love will not allow us to write anybody off. Love will, will compel us and move us to get them to Jesus. Now there's a third and final thing that I would have you to see concerning the devices of Satan. There's an unforgiving spirit. There's an unconfirmed love. But, but now there's a third thing and that is an unproven uh, obedience. You know what? When you refuse to forgive, when you refuse to love as God loves you, you are opening the door for Satan to move into your life and into your heart and set up shop. And I'm telling you, when you give Satan an inch... That is just the beginning. And it starts with, I'm not forgiving. It starts with, I'm not loving. That's all Satan needs. Is just a, you don't have to throw the door wide open. Just, just to raise the window a little bit. And Satan comes in and Satan moves and Satan works until Satan has set up shop. Notice the third thing, and that is an unproven obedience. See it in verse 9. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. You see, he says, you, you not only have to forgive, you not only have to love, but you have to obey. Do what I've told you to do. I, I tell you, if, if we could just take a test real quick. <laughs> don't, don't, don't start popping pills. It's, it's not going to be bad. <laughs> if we could take a test, I think surely one of the ways that we can determine whether we are making spiritual progress or not is this. We do what we do. Because we want to obey God. We don't have to be prodded. We don't have to be, uh, we don't have to be uh, encouraged from an outside source. We don't have to have external stimuli. We just do what we do because we know if we do it, we'll be obeying God. One of the simplest commands in the Bible is this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Why? For this is right. That's what he said. Obey the Lord because it's the right thing to do. I was reading this last week one of my, one of my favorite accounts in the life of David. David had been in a battle. And he sits down and he says, and his three generals are gathered around him. And David says in the presence of those generals, you can almost see that scene before your eyes. And David longingly says, I wish I had a drink of water from the wells of Bethlehem. And those three soldiers left immediately, went behind enemy lines, and got some fresh water from the wells of Bethlehem and brought to David. I read that and I thought, Lord, that's what it means to be obedient. Just the hint, and they're gone. Just the word. And they're willing to put their lives on the line in order to please and satisfy the king. They did that for a mere human. They do that for a mere human. What should we do for the Lord who saved us and washed us in his blood? We ought to do what pleases the Lord. So he says, I want you to forgive him. I want you to love him. And I want you to do it out of obedience. You know what the Bible says about obedience? To obey. To obey is better than sacrifice. Let's bring a big check and give it to the church. All right? Let's uh, not miss any services this summer. All right? Let's do everything we can for the cause of Christ. Get uh, offerings and take FBI. And let's do all these good things. All right? Well, I have pleased the Lord if I do all that. Well, see, I don't know. And the reason I don't know is because I don't know your heart. You can do all of that 
and still be backslidden and still be out of the will of God. Because this thing about the Christian life, it's not about externals, it's about what's on the inside. And I'm going to tell you, this matter of obedience to the Lord, that is an inside job. Obedience to God is determined here, demonstrated out here. Now, if it starts out here, then you know what that is? That's legalism. That's for show. That's being ostentatious. But when it starts here, and it demonstrates itself here, that is obedience that honors God. So here's a guy out of the will of God. Here's a guy that has fallen. And the Paul said, I want you to forgive him. I want you to love him. I want you to obey. And here's why. If you don't, Satan will use that to do a number in your own heart and in your own life. See, here's the deal. Probably the church is not going to condemn you if you don't have a forgiving spirit. Probably nobody's going to ever call you out because you don't forgive. Probably nobody will ever say to you, you know, you don't have a very loving heart. But God will know. You'll know. Satan will know. And Satan will use that unforgiveness. He'll use that unproven obedience. He'll use that unexpressed love to destroy your life. I want us to stand together and bow our heads. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. This will be your opportunity to respond to God's call His leadership upon your life. Now listen to me this morning. If you've never been saved. You've never acknowledged that you are a sinner. In need of God's grace. In need of God's salvation. Then this morning we're going to invite you to come to Jesus. Salvation is not in religious activity. Salvation is in a person. And that person is Jesus. If you've never been saved. We invite you to come to Jesus. Acknowledge your sin and believe. That's what the Bible says. Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. This morning, is there someone you need to express your love toward? This morning, is there someone you need to forgive? This morning, is there someone, something that you need to obey from God? Don't be ignorant of the devices of Satan. The greatest thing we can do The greatest need we have in our battle against Satan is truth. If you'll shine the light on Satan, that's the one thing he can't stand. It's truth, the light. Shine the light on Satan with truth. Father in heaven, we pray now that you'll use the message for your glory. We pray that we would not be ignorant of Satan's devices. And Father, we pray now that lost people would come to believe on Christ We pray that your people, those who have been saved, those who belong to you, would be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Roger Copeland, pastor of Northern Hills Baptist Church in Texarkana. We want to thank you for sharing in our services by means of television. Our prayer and desire is that if you don't have a faith relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that even now, you would believe on Him. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, if you will acknowledge that you're a sinner and in need of Jesus Christ, you can be saved right now by asking the Lord Jesus to save you and to forgive you of your sins. If you need help or someone just to pray with you concerning your walk with Christ, feel free to call on us and at your convenience, we'd love to meet with you and to share God's plan for your life and to pray with you. May the Lord bless you as our prayer.